in our seminar about robotics, which we hope very much, and if, if some of the Python have been to into a, another legal firm in a robotics seminar, I just don't tell me because I'd like to be deluded about these things. But we think it's the first robotics uh, seminar that the law firm has held in London, which is great for us. Um, but thank you very much for coming. The, um, a few ad admin uh, details, you know, all the restrooms out there, turn left and, and around the corner. And from a fire alarm perspective, I have a very good authority. None have been planned, so if the bell goes off, uh, follow me. I'll be running very quickly down the corridor. Um, we are here this afternoon to have a look at the rise of the robot um, and to discuss the implications that the rise of the robot and robotics will have and, and is having on, on business and on society as a whole. Now I looked up um, the definition of robots uh, just before I came down in the Oxford English Dictionary. Uh, three definitions which was helpful. One is a machine resembling or functioning like a human. Uh, another one was a machine automatically completing a mechanical process. And the third definition was a person who acts mechanically. So hopefully <laughs> I won't be the third. Uh, so the first two is I think we're, where we're going to be. And, and, and this time, where we are, 2015, uh, April 2015, it, it, it reminds me very much of, of, of where, from a, certainly from a legal perspective, where IT lawyers, technology lawyers, were in, in the mid-90s. And, and the reason I say that is that we were just on the cusp of a, of a very large technological revolution, mainly called the internet. And, and, and so, from an audience participation perspective, there's a few questions I'd like to ask. You know, there's a few people from Google here. So I will be reporting back if you get this wrong. So have a guess, when, when was Google incorporated? Shout out the year. When do you think Google was incorporated? 98. 98. Bang on. <laughs> 98. In fact, September the 4th, 1988. When do you think the first iPod, iPod was sold? Go on, give us a year. Go on, get it. Well, you must have had one. Come on. 2001, absolutely right. Yeah, 23rd October. Twitter. When was Twitter incorporated? 2006. March 2006. And the first iPhone was sold 29th June 2007. So in, in that time, in that, in that year from 98 to 2007 to where we are now, we have experienced a vast leap in the way technology has worked and the way technology has changed the way we interact and the way we do business. And I think we are right back in that situation in 1995 as we stand here today in relation to robotics. Um, and, and so very much what I would like to get out of today is a, is a view and some thoughts about how we think robots are going to change society and the way we do business and how the law looks at robotics and how it needs to change and adapt to take account of new technology. Now I'm delighted but uh, in this quest for knowledge, um, I've got Andrew, um, Andrew Burgess, uh, who is a management co consultant, been a management consultant for the best part of 22 years, mm. has, has been involved in a host of major change projects all over the world, and involved in a, a all range of industry sectors. He's currently director of source consulting and has a national reputation for uh, his work in robotic process automation and we hope we look looking forward to Andrew talking to us about the influences that robotics will have on society and business. And sitting next to Andrew is Hugh, Hugh Hampson Jones. Um, Hugh began his career as a graduate trainee at Port Sunlight with the Unilever group. So it's very much like coming home as we were discussing and he's still got an account downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Hugh's career then took him through Philips Industries, Harris Corporation, a stint at McDonnell Douglas, joined Siemens in 1990, and then spent 10 years in Sweden uh, specialising in technology company development for <coughs> European venture capitalists. 2010, Hugh returned to the UK and is now CEO of Oxys Energy. Oxys is the leading R&D company in, in the world uh, looking at development of new generation lithium sulfur batteries. And Chu will talk to us about his his company and the way his company is working with drivers, cars, and technology, and the technology that Oxys brings to a whole range of features that drivers, cars being the one that we talk about the most. So, Andrew, would you like to uh, Thank you. unmute your... I think it's yeah, unmuted. And away you go. Brilliant. Thanks, Chris. Thank 
So, as Chris said, my name is Andrew Burgess. I'm a, I'm a director at Source Consulting. Most of the work, my day job is outsourcing advisory work, so I advise companies how to do outsourcing. But also got a bit of a reputation for understanding the robots and what the impact that that has on the outsourcing industry. So, I'm going to talk to you today, introduce robots to you, what they do, the sorts of robots they are, uh, what the impact on society is and could be, and then a bit of a deep dive in terms of what that impact is on outsourcing specifically. So, a bit of a, a step back in time, as Chris and me talking about. So, it was 40 years ago that uh, the first mobile phone call was made from a street corner in New York. 30 years ago, the internet didn't exist at all. This is, what, this is a newspaper that people used to read, I don't know if you remember those. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, there was 130 websites existed in, in the world. Uh, Google, as we now know, wasn't one of those. And then 10 years ago, pretty much all of these websites didn't exist at all, including Facebook, YouTube, Google, etc. Now, of course, the internet is ubiquitous, it's everywhere. But today, everyone is talking about robots. And people are saying, today is the age of the robots. But why today? Because everyone knows robots have been around, <coughs> excuse me, been around for a long time. This is a picture of the robots in the Cowley plant, Elston Rover. My first job after I left university was in this factory uh, working for Austin Rover, making those bastions of automotive industry, the Montego and the Maestro, if anyone remembers those. Um, but the robots were here, so what, what's, what's changed now? Why are we talking about robots now uh, when they existed so long ago? So I think there's four things that, that are driving this, this, uh, this age of the robots. The first one is big data. There's so much data around that, that robots and machines and computers are able to manipulate and exploit. Secondly, the storage. So storing all that data has become much more uh, cheaper and also we can do it uh, more disparately, i.e. on the cloud. Secondly, in terms of processing all that data, we can do it much faster. And thirdly, connectivity. So all these machines and all this data is connected in a way that we've never seen before. And even the robots themselves have, uh, have their own uh, knowledge repository called RoboBrain. It's like a, a Wikipedia for robots. So all, all these four drivers are really driving the, the, the age of the robots. And just to put that into perspective, here's, here's a few examples. So this is 1956. This is a computer being loaded onto a plane with a forklift truck. The capacity of this computer is five megabytes. That's enough for one Taylor Swift song. <laughs> Here's a, an advert from 1975 for, uh, pro looks like a modest IBM computer, office computer, the 5110, uh, which sells for under $18,000. And then finally, this is the, in 1982, this is the hard disk you have been waiting for. Uh, 10 megabytes, that's two Taylor Swift songs, uh, for $3,398. So you can see the change that, that, that's happened in all those areas. But what about today? So I'm going to talk about three different types of robots <coughs> to explain those. First one is the physical robots. Secondly, virtual robots. And thirdly, the intelligent robots, the artificial intelligence, which is really a subset of both of these, these previous two. So let's look at physical robots first. So here's an example. This, this robot's called Baxter. It was uh, made by a company called Rethink Robotics in the US. And the great thing about this robot is very easy to teach. So if you want to teach something, you just move the arms around and it learns how to do it. It has lots of sensors around it, but you notice it's not in a cage like a lot of other. You know, those previous ones I showed you from Austin Rover, they're all in cages, humans can't go. This robot can work alongside a human. If it senses <coughs> something, something's gonna happen, it will stop working, it's very safe. The cost of this robot is about $15,000, so very, very cheap. So you can see the potential for the, this sort of robot. These robots, these orange things, are called Kiva. <coughs> they work in warehouses, they take and deliver uh, goods for picking, so if you bought anything from Amazon, it's probably traveled on one of these robots at some point. Uh, there are restaurants in Japan that are totally manned by robots. In the kitchen, there's robots making the food, there's robots serving the food, you pay the robots. No humans involved, quite scary. And uh, driverless cars, which you're gonna hear a little bit more about again, this is the one from Google, uh, but also, you should know there's, there's a, a driverless car that was, that was designed in the UK that's just driven from San Francisco to New York. It, it required human intervention on 50 miles out of the 3,400 mile journey that it took. So that's the kind of technology that, 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 that or what the potential that technology is capable of at the moment. 
And finally, in, in medical science, so that, you know, the, the ability for uh, robots to do uh, operations remotely, for doctors to be in different countries uh, diagnosing patients, etc. Lots of potential for robots there. But the area that's, that's really interesting for me is the virtual robots. So in our world, we call this robotic process automation. And this is the defined as a flexible use, flexible tools to automate manual activities for delivery of business processes or IT services. So essentially, this is replacing humans with software robots. Okay? Sorry, just going back mm. to your discussion on robots. Yes. So, what, so you gave us lots of examples of robots. Yes. What, what do you define as a robot in a robot process? For, for generally, yeah. I, I, think, I think Chris's definition earlier on about, about it's, yeah. the, it's the human replacement. It's, it's taking something that's done by a human and getting a machine to do that. I think that's the key thing. whether it's autonomous or not. Yeah. I, th I think those are two different things. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, I, think, I think there are non-autonomous robots, definitely. So the, the, uh, the Da Vinci uh, operating machine, doing, doing the operation on the prostate, that's, that's operated by a doctor, but it's done remotely, so the technology is in the control of that robot, yeah. So within robotic process and auto automation, probably the best way to explain this is, is what's generally called swivel chair processing. So if you imagine, Somebody working at a desk, they get an application form in and they key that information into one system, then they go and do a credit check on another system, they go to another system and, and put some more information in, they go back to the first one and then put a zero in front of the account number because that's what they do. All that work can be done by a robot now and trained very, very easily to do that. Okay? You can take that person out that does that work, train the robot to do it. So the sorts of things that, that are happening now that people are, people are automating through this process. Um, I'll just go through these quickly so you can have a look. Wide range of processes, a lot in financial services and compliance, uh, SIM card processing, accounts receivable, accounts payable. All these processes now can be done by robots. Here's some numbers to kind of illustrate that. So 24% is the amount one telecoms firm um, reduced the staff needed for UK back office customer service processes by the introduction of a software robot. Half is the number of days taken to close a month end books of a primary health care trust from 12 by introducing robots. And now they estimate that 50% is the amount of the same firm thinks the head can't be reduced by after three years. Two is the number of minutes taken to resolve failed trade instance in an FS firm from 40. So it's going from 40 minutes to two minutes, again with no, no human intervention. A third is the typical cost of a software agent compared to a typical offshore BPO. So, for example, somebody uh, based in India. And then if you compare that to an onshore FTE, that's about a ninth. So you can see the business case for this can be quite compelling. And zero is the amount of hours that the software robots need for sleep, eating, and sickness, and holiday, etc. These are the sorts of firms that are using robotic process automation already. So there's some very big names in that. Um, NPower, for example, they've, they've uh, automated about 40 major processes in their business. They say about 200 FTEs in that business through automation. So intelligent robots, artificial intelligence. So just to put this in context, here's the spectrum uh, we talked about. So the, the rules-based structure stuff is what I've just been talking about, the, the robotic process automation. Then you move into this semi-structured and unstructured world where you're looking at artificial intelligence and cognitive capabilities. Here there's lots of research being done and some quite sexy examples you know, out in, in the literature. This is where there's actual examples in industry now. So within the AI, using semi-structured, based on semi-structured data, there's some really useful things being done. So here's some real examples. Here's some software, types of software that exist um, in contract management. So we're in a law firm now. So in terms of managing contracts, all of these bits of software can do things across this, all of this uh, contract life cycle. So, for example, discovery, so going into your organization, understanding where the contracts are and what type of contracts they are. That's the first piece of it. Searching through the contracts to understand what the contracts say and extracting the information from that. For example, limits of liability. Limits of liability can be, as you know, expressed in many different ways from, you know, it's, it's an absolute value or it's, it's a multiple of contract, contract value the software can understand that and extract that information. Once you've got the information out, 
then you can do analytics on it. So you can measure your risk, for example, across your complete uh, contract portfolio using that information. What format do the documents have to be in, though, for that to be capable of taking? Digital. So it could be uh, a Word document or a scanned document or something. Okay. Yeah. Then you get into the action side. So once you've got the, the information out, then you get into the RPA, the robotic process automation piece, so you can take actions based on the information that comes out. The bit here at the end with opinion, I think that's the bit that we haven't got yet. That's the cognitive area. But I think that's the area that, that the AI stuff will move into as it gets cleverer and cleverer. But we're not quite there yet. But we can do all of these other stages. Here's another good example. This is in the insurance industry. We've got a client here um, who we're doing a, a pilot for in the AI space. The point of this example is that the cost saving, the, sorry, the benefits are not all around cost savings. It's around the additional value that the AI can, can, can deliver. So this firm works in the Lloyds market, so there's lots of paper. All the, all the insurance contracts are, are paper driven. So the first thing they do is scan them. They read through them. They take all the relevant information out of that. They store it in their systems, and they, and they manage the contracts. So that's the process. At the moment, this bit here is done by a legal process outsourcing firm in Chennai. And you can see from what I've just told you, that AI systems can quite easily take that over and do all that process. So there's an immediate cost saving taking that LPO provider out of the equation and just replacing it with software. But it becomes really interesting when you look at the historical information. So this is quite an old firm. It's been around for a, a hundred or so years. They've got lots, <coughs> lots and lots of historical documents. If you can scan, analyze, and tag them, and also assess those contracts, evaluate them for how successful they've been, again using the AI systems, then you can, in theory, write better insurance because you know which contracts were successful, which contracts weren't successful. Getting that knowledge and insight means you can do your business better up front. If you can, in, you know, for example, in, uh, improve the, the business you write by even 0.1%, you know, that's going to fire away any saving you're going to get in cost <coughs> savings here. So there's real additional value as well as cost savings from AI. So how is this going to affect society as a whole? Well, here's a graph that uh, shows you a number of lines. The, the, the important ones to look at is the red one, which is the employment to population ratio. Uh, the dashed line is, is a profit line. This is all US businesses. Um, uh, as companies grow, they make more profit. They tend to invest in machines and they hire people. What you can see here is the hiring people is stopping. It's slowing down. People are still buying machines, but they're not hiring the people. So if you, if you project that forward, as the working age population goes up, the jobs, the jobs per head of population doesn't climb as much. So these jaws, as we go forward, are just going to get wider and wider, which is quite frightening. So what can society do about it? So the first thing to say is, I'm an optimist. This is definitely a glass half full. Okay? And I think the world shares this view, because if you Google um, glass half empty, you get 8 million responses. If you Google glass half full, you get 64 million responses. So I think the world shares my optimism. Uh, so the first thing to point out then is, is resistance is futile. Uh, there's a book, a very good book, by uh, Eric Binyolson and Andrew McAbee called Race Against the Machines. And they say resisting the, ro the robots is futile. They're going to keep improving. And companies are going to keep buying and deploying them. And more fundamentally, resistance is deeply misguided because it's exactly the same as resisting progress towards a post-drudgery, post-sweatshop world. So if you take a step back and you think about automation generally, every time you've pressed one on that keypad to check your balance, or you've used an ATM machine, or you clicked on buy it now on a shopping website, you're taking part in a transaction that used to have a human being at the other end of it. All that's been automated. I think society and business has, has managed and adapted to take, to take, um, to take a, a consideration of this. Um, there's going to be some losers. If you look at bookshops, for example, that's going to change. But is, this is probably really just the evolution of a business, natural evol evolution of business. And I think you know, nobody nowadays laments the loss of the lamplighter. If you look at the benefits, the customers, so if, if anyone's got, um, got an, taken on an O2 contract recently, the provisioning process for that SIM card used to be you had to ring up, and go through a whole process, and then eventually, you know, you'd be turning your phone off and on again, and probably 24 hours later or not, 
your, your U number will come through. It's a very uh, long, drawn-out process. Nowadays, it's done with completely without a human. It takes about 10 minutes. It's all done online. So the customer service aspect of, of robotics is changing dramatically. Another reason, I think, to be, to be optimistic, if you, if you compare this to the uh, computer um, revolution that, that happened, originally it offered lots and lots of uh, productivity improvements, which, which came, but not to the extent that, they, that everyone thought they would, because computers have generated a, an ecosystem of their own, the overheads of their own. So you've got chip manufacturing plants, you've got IT standards bodies, you've got you know, loads of help desks around. All these create additional work. And if you look at robots, robots still need to be designed, you need to build them, you need to market them, you need to sell them, you need to maintain them, regulate them, fix them, fuel them, upgrade them, and eventually dispose of them. So there's going to be a whole market around this which is going to grow up. And if you think about the computer market as well, it generated its own industries as well, things like gaming and online movie streaming. So there's no reason why robotics can't do the same thing. And if you think about the jobs that are being done by robots. So um, they start off being very manual, and then they moved into the business process area. And on the opposite scale to burn out is bore out. People get very stressed if they're doing very menial tasks again and again. So now it's the robots that will be doing that work. They're not, they're not going to complain about stress. They're not going to moan about anything. So what it's going to give people is the opportunity to spend their time in more valuable ways or not work at all. And there's, there's a real, if we can get the balance right in terms of the, the, the dynamics of, of the, the economic model, I think you know, there's no reason why we can't go into a four-day week or a third-day week, and I think that's something that you know, everyone would, would vote for. Do you think that it's inevitable that it's going to be a bit more than sharper? I guess where this leads to is a little bit sharper divide between the haves and the have-nots. Mm. Because obviously, we're really yeah. at a high level. You're at a high level. Exactly. So I think you know, this is why people need to be cognizant of it now. And we need to train people. We need to be aware of it. So you know, people like the BPO providers that, that have all these people that won't, be, you know, won't ha have meaningful work need to do something to start retraining people. So that leads me on to, very nicely, what, what we can do about it. So I think the first thing is education. So governments need to change their policies to more focus on education, particularly the subjects that help develop um, technology physics, chemistry, biology, mathematics, and also the, the subjects that can help exploit technology, such as computer science, engineering, entrepreneurship, psychology, etc. And this isn't a wholesale shift of policy. This is just more of a focus on those particular subjects. The second thing to look, to look at for governments is around infrastructure, development of infrastructure. One, because us humans will still need to get around, probably in our driverless cars, and we'll need to communicate, but also robots aren't very good at building bridges. And thirdly, um, robots are very good at being told what to do. Um, but if you tell a robot to make a crap TV, it's going to make a crap TV. It's going to do it quicker and faster and cheaper, but it's still going to make a crap TV. There's still going to be a role for people in terms of best practice and innovation to work out how to make better TVs and all the other things as well. It's, a bit, it's analogous to the old adage of don't outsource a problem, don't automate a crap process. Yes, yeah, so I think right now, right. definitely, the, 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 it will move up and up, that, that value. So we're going to have to keep moving with the robots, exactly. Well, Sorry? Well, yeah, that. yeah, exactly, yeah. What, what I'm trying to do is keep it within the realms of what's, what's around today and in the near future, rather than trying to so look at the science fiction piece, yeah. But I think, you know, at the moment, this is where, I think this is where we are. So I'm just going to do a deep dive on, on outsourcing, what the implications are for outsourcing. So I think right now people talk about sourcing strategies. I think people are going to then talk about automation strategies as well. We're already dealing with our clients talking about automation strategy. At the moment, as part of the sourcing strategy, but I think in the future it will be the automation strategy first, the sourcing strategy will come second. So if you've got some, you know, a, an area that you want to transform, the first question is, will be, how do we automate this? And then how do, we, how do we outsource, rather than the moment we're saying, how do we outsource it, and then what can we automate? I think there's going to be a shift around, and that's going to happen quite quickly. Um, automation will, will be divorced from IT, 
So the technology, although, although the software here is really, really clever, implementing it is really, really easy. So once you've got the software implemented, it's the business people that are going to be running those processes. And that's, that's a shift as well away from, from where we are at the moment. It's going to be a change of focus as well. So instead of cost reduction being the only driver, remember the O2 example with the SIM card, people are going to be focused on quality, audibility, and business value. And remember the, um, the contracts as well. Uh, that we looked at with the insurance firm. And again, it's going to be cost, customer focus driven um, as well. So again, looking at the O2 example, it's going to be customers demanding this. They're not, want to, not wanting to go through that horrible process of getting their SIM card working if it can be done quicker, even if that means the robot doing it. Uh, everything will become pay as you go. Uh, robots allow you to be more predictable in the cost. They allow you to ramp up the services up and down much quicker. So it allows this everything as a service to become much more viable. And another area within, within outsourcing, everyone's you know, previously been looking at offshoring, there's now going to be moved to, to reshoring. It's going to be much more economically viable to bring work back onshore if you can automate a large chunk of it. And then what you're left with is, is having some onshore services uh, provided by some sort of higher value resources. So onshore repatriation become the, become the norm. And then finally, I think there's a real opportunity here for, for robots and technology to help disadvantaged people in the world. So there's an area of, um, of outsourcing called impact sourcing, which, which provides jobs and education to people who are either economically disadvantaged or physically disadvantaged or, or mentally disadvantaged. And software here can be the great leveler for everybody. So, you know, from a physical point of view, you've got exoskeletons, etc. But even from a business point of view, you have to remember that, that robots need digital inputs. We talked a bit earlier about the documents that come into it. They, they have to be digital at some point. One of the key areas that impact sourcing delivers is di digitalization of documents. So they do lots of work on um, uh, birth certificates and, and old documents as well. But digitizing stuff here, it's like the marriage made in heaven. You use the impact sourcing at the beginning to provide the input into, into the robots there. So I think there's you know, some real good that can come out of that. So if there's one thing I want you to kind of take away from, from that kind of race through, through the robotics piece, I think, you know, be the optimist. I think it's, a case, it's not a case of race, um, racing against the machines. I think it's a race uh, with the machines. Thank you. We've got some uh, time at the end, hopefully, for some more questions. Uh, so you can save them up, write them down, and then we can do that. And now I'm to you. You need to turn me on. Oh, come here. Yeah, I think you're Thank you very much. This was mine, was that? Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, let me just make sure I have this. Left and right. Hmm? Okay. Um, I don't intend to talk about battery technology uh, this afternoon. I'm focusing on uh, automated, automated and robotics, but it is fundamental to some of the principles that you'll see uh, as we go through the presentation. Um, this is a driverless electric vehicle. It is with us today. It has been tested at West Point Military Academy, Stamford University, and it's now uh, about to begin trials on the roads of London and uh, only a month ago whether he'll be Minister of State for Business after May the 7th I don't know but uh, he has been a prominent supporter of the move towards driverless electric vehicles and it's fair to say I think that Britain uh, it's fair to say that Britain is leading the way with regard to the drive towards uh, more automation on our roads. So, if I take the uh, first, first of all, it, the paradigm shift is here. Um, of course, you have the Google car and you have other cars as well. And the car manufacturers in Europe, and I am dealing with uh, quite a number of them, are seriously looking at uh, greater automation to reduce injury and uh, insurance claims. And I'd, I'll come on to that as a specific issue when I show you what's taking place in Greenwich. 
The vehicle that you've just seen there is the world's first commercially available driverless car. And I'll come on to some of the technological aspects of it shortly. The idea is, of course, that the vehicle carries a passenger group of 8 to 12 people and can go along designated routes without the need for drivers. Now London is considered the only mega city in Europe. If you go over to China, for example, in the district of uh, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, you will see that the mega city there is of a uh, capacity of around 50 to 60 million citizens. So London is relatively quite small, but it's still regarded as a mega city in Europe. Now, the key issue is that in England alone, I wonder if, how many of you know what is the average time spent in a car per person in England. Does anyone know? The average driver in England spends 235 hours driving every year, the equivalent of six weeks, six working weeks. Okay. 94% of road accidents and deaths involve human error. And the idea of automated driving is, in fact, to reduce that. And that is why one insurance company, I'll tell you who it is shortly, is working with us to uh, empirically develop data as to see how driverless vehicles could help reduce uh, accidents and uh, premiums. Now, everyone's of the opinion you can get in a car, drive to Oxford, read the paper and get there safely. Well, my view is that the initial focus is going to be on private campuses. Uh, areas where universities um, uh, and we are particularly working with U US universities where car parking and uh, congestion is a real, real problem as well as estate management. So I don't think we should be talking in terms of you in the next five years thinking that you're going to get in a car in London drive all the way to Cardiff or Edinburgh, and you're just merrily going to read a book while you're doing so. I think that's impractical, and the press, in my opinion, has got it wrong. But what we can look at are private sites, military bases, airports, major hospitals. I mean, if you take the Texans, Texas State University, there are over 50,000 students at that university. The Camping, car parking facilities dwarfs any problems that we have here in London. So, and I'll give you some further uh, statistics on, uh, that may be relevant uh, to us here. 31, in, this is, applies to the United Kingdom. 31% of women do not have driving licenses. 14% of men do not have driving licenses. Now this is the interesting figure. 46% of 17 to 30 year olds do not have driving licenses. It's having a marked effect on the European car manufacturers. You know, it's fine China uh, selling over 2 million cars a month. It's a big market. But the European markets are suffering from the ability to sell new cars. So, the concept of the last mile and the connected vehicle is something that's becoming important for the general public. The idea is that you turn up to Heathrow and then from that car park at Heathrow or at Stansted, you go from there in a driverless electric vehicle. And that is the focus that is being applied today in the projects that we are projecting. So this is a real project. And just to give you an idea, it's uh, 8 million pounds is being spent on this. Two and a half million are being sp is being spent on the driverless vehicles alone. And what we are doing, uh, we are working with TRL. TRL, for those of you who may or may not know, is the, was the old transport research laboratories based in uh, Wokingham. They're now privatized and they are experts in understanding transportation issues. 
So we have joined forces with TRL and the Royal Borough of Greenwich, but the two other interesting, or three other interesting parties uh, to that are Royal Dutch Shell, Royal Sun Alliance, and Telefonica. Now each of them is participating in this project to seek to understand what is the public's reaction to driverless electric vehicle. And the vehicle that we showed you, which we demoed in Greenwich, yes, yes, the first reaction is a kid wants to jump in front of the vehicle to see if it stops dead. It does stop dead, right? But as the public becomes aware of it, it becomes more relaxed about it. But it's the silence of the vehicle itself creates a problem. It's can it react fast enough to a cat or a dog coming out suddenly, etc., etc. But the purpose, this is a two-year program, and the purpose of it is purely to work on understanding how the public reacts. Uh, RSA is there to manage the risk management. What are the consequences of driverless electric vehicles and what are the risks associated with that, etc., etc. And it's possible also that we will join forces with another European car manufacturer to bring in the concept of uh, park uh, vehicles. So effectively, you go to a car park, you get out of the car, and the car parks of, of its own, which leads to more efficient parking. So the, 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 the fact is that this is real. And the insurance industry recognizes that the potential benefits in increased automated vehicle technology will, in their mind, reduce insurance claims over the course of the next uh, decade. This is just to uh, give you an insight. I know you're lawyers, you love attention to detail, but I won't bore you with the technology. Um, but essentially, it's made up of a complex array of technology, including optics, lasers, and uh, what's known as simultaneous localization and mapping. This is nothing like GPS. GPS is a flawed technology, fine for the micro or the macro understanding of getting from A to B. But in this, if you look at the optics and the uh, SLAM, it is ping the environment 25 times a second. Right? Now this is important, in, I believe, an issue of law, which I'll come on to uh, later. So this is very important because GPS does not work underground. So if you take this vehicle, as we have tested it in, uh, in the US, into an underpassage, for example, between one campus and the next, well, you can't rely on the GPS. You have to rely on these quite new, sophisticated software technologies uh, for uh, the development of the vehicle. And obviously the two-year program will look into the various aspects of the SLAM, optics, uh, and telematics. Now, the reason why Telefonica is interested in the, this project is the idea that the vehicles will transmit telemetry details as to where it is. Because if you're a fleet manager managing a fleet of these vehicles in Heathrow or in Los Angeles, then you need to know where the vehicles are at what point, and if there's an accident or a danger or a fire, etc., etc. So there is now a, com a convergence of insurance, telemetry, uh, telephonica, and of course the actual uh, statistics and data that's being captured on the vehicle. I'm just going to give you examples at West Point Military Academy. The idea is that these vehicles could be used in combat situations. So you have a, I'll give you an example, this is a true example, um, you have an exercise where you have several thousand soldiers, at the moment you have to feed them. So at the moment you have to get a lorry, get a driver and drive that uh, vast amount of uh, logistics out. Well, if you could just put it into a driverless electric vehicle, plot the map, plot the distance, plot the destination, then of course it frees up men. And you will see this becoming a recurring theme 
whether it's at Stanford University, whether it's at Los Angeles Airport, whether it's at Heathrow, the ability to free up human resources, um, which is not flexible. Because if you're having to provide a 24-hour service at an airport, you can save a vast amount of labor costs by eliminating the drivers that are required uh, for that. You can also see these vehicles being used for logistics, uh, maybe on a major manufacturing plant, uh, whereby they can transport goods from one end of the plant to another uh, automatically. Um, the USA is the first country to permit the testing of uh, driverless electric vehicles. However, only four states have approved it. And in law, this is an interesting point, before you can even start the testing, you have to secure a bond of $5 million. Not exactly the most uh, best way of incentivizing R&D into, um, into the technology. Um, these are the other examples. Um, I'm, I'm not going to dwell on each one. Bear in mind that the vehicle that I have shown you, and if any of you are interested over the course of the next few months to uh, have the vehicle demonstrated, um, then we can do so at Greenwich. But remember, you could call that vehicle using an iPad. So in effect, you're at one end of the building, you're at a campus, a university campus, and you're at one department, you want to go across to the other department, rather than drive a university vehicle, you call the vehicle to your department, and then it takes you to a, a given point. And we can demonstrate this already uh, at Greenwich. But I, I can see that there's going to be more and more uh, complexity uh, especially as you try to link up with other forms of transportation uh, as well. So, the, I'll leave you to pose some of these questions, but the issue of liability is, in my, my opinion, very real. I can see five areas for review, um, and that is, first, the vehicle driver, then I can see the vehicle operator, because you could have a, a company that's operating many of these vehicles. If I give you an example of a major leisure company in uh, the United States, they would be looking at possibly managing 600 of these vehicles. So you're a vehicle operator here. If you're doing a community service operation in the uh, areas of Bradford or Leeds, you could have maybe have 12 of these to transport citizens from given points uh, of the city, providing, of course, the vehicle's not nicked on the way, but that's, that's... The vehicle manufacturer will have to. I mean, these are software, complex software uh, tools. They are complex optics. And also the service provider, the person who is giving information on where those vehicles are, and last but not least, the data providers. So the reason I'm mentioning that is I think the driverless electric vehicles will have to have data recorders not dissimilar to airlines. Because if a crash occurs, there has to be some mechanism to provide data as to what led up to the crash. And one of the things that um, uh, the CEO of Daimler made, which I thought was a very important point. Uh, it's, a, in my opinion, a rather clumsy expression, but I, nevertheless, I'm going to use it. He used the word ethics elasticity, yeah. right? Only a German would use that, wouldn't they? Uh, ethics elasticity. Now, what he meant was, what happens if the driverless vehicles goes over an overtaking two lines which indicate uh, that you cannot overtake. But he's, ov he's overtaking to give more room for the cyclist. And he's taken a decision to breach that to give, and then of course, an accident occurs. Another a driverless electric vehicle encounters, uh, and he has to make a choice. Does he crash into the side of the road? or does it crash into the individual that's on the road? These are areas that I think the data recording will be fundamental to legal claims that must inevitably arise as a consequence of that. So 
Um, the other area that I think will also have to be reviewed, this may reflect my background in um, uh, uh, security, uh, cyber security. For many years I worked in what's known as PKI security, public key encryption. The public key encryption is, if you like, a very modern reflection of the German Enigma machine, if I can draw that uh, comparison. Cyber security, I think, is going to be a real issue, a real, real issue, because um, I think that the vast amount of data that you are going to store, the consequences of no, wanting to know what that data is, and the understanding what led up to this, that, and that, um, I think uh, is going to be of critical importance. Now, you are the lawyers, you work out what the implications of that in law, but I think that's going to be uh, quite critical. The, um, these are just, uh, these are real examples um, that basically, if you move towards uh, driverless electric vehicles, if you go to a typical business, typical hospital, typical campus, not, not just in um, America, but also in the United Kingdom, you will find that they have vast amounts of vehicles, and vast amount of those vehicles remain unused throughout the day. But every time you take that vehicle out, you have to drive, you have to park it, etc., etc., etc. So in the, 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 one of the key advantages of driverless electric vehicles is to reduce the number of vehicles required on a given uh, site and the fact that they can be used 24 hours and you don't necessarily need people available uh, for that. Now that's part of the managed service and that's what we are actively talking to with uh, one British university. The ability to eliminate all petrol engines off the campus, reduce the number of vehicles, and therefore reduce the labor costs and maintenance costs associated with those vehicles. What you may or may not realize um, is that, by the way, electric vehicles are much, much simpler to maintain, and the cost of maintenance is much less reduced. So I believe uh, that is the last slide, I think. Um, no, this is just to show you the uh, project that we're working on in um, Greenwich is really going to contribute to these sections here, which is to the, uh, the development of regulations associated with uh, driverless electric vehicles. So the data from uh, the Greenwich program will be used to influence both UK domestic regulations as well as contribute to the regulations uh, in, uh, in Europe. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, sure. Does the assumption that, I'm wrong, but you would have to make sure that there were no other kind of vehicles, including bicycles and things, within that sort of environment, because if it does stop automatically for a bike, and you're on a campus, and lots of cyclists are cycling around. I just know driving into London, a nightmare is, as a human, kind of having to stop and start and cyclists doing silly manoeuvres and stuff. Sorry, Jay. But it's true. Um, you know, you've got to sort of say, if that thing's going to stop all the time, then it's not going to get from A to B very quickly if you've got things stopping it from making progress. <laughs> That's fair comment. I mean, that's something that has, that is part of the study, you see. Because the, I mean, it's difficult for me, I'd have to show you, take you on the vehicle. Because the vehicle can recompute. It, it sort of looks around, and then it says, well, that's the obstacle, so it goes round. Okay. Um, but you're right. Those are the issues that we now need to address using empirical data. Because you, you can't just stop and start, stop and start. But it, it's capable of reading signs. For example, it can read a sign in the, in the distance. Uh, it, can, it can tell the difference between red and traffic lights, etc., etc. It can spot a zebra crossing, etc. But you're right, th those are areas, I'm not saying that we have the answers yet, but those are the purpose of this £8 million uh, program. The government in total, the UK government in total, is spending £19 million. Pounds. So this is one project. There's another project in Coventry and another project in Bristol. Uh, for the same reason. Can I ask whether there be a common framework for different uh, driverless car manufacturers to follow? I believe. I, I, 
No, well, no, I, I think like even with today's cars, there's a common framework. I mean, all new cars go through homologation uh, certification and I'm not saying every, so they'll have to go through homologation and processes. Will they be able to communicate Will they be able to? I believe, I, 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 we haven't got that yet, but in my view is that I don't think that's a huge step in terms of using, um, you know, telecommunications uh, technology to, to communicate. Yeah, um, but we haven't got, that, uh, got there. But I think that the purpose of the program is to set up standards. Um, and, um, and, and so uh, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, variable, um, but they, uh, for this one in Greenwich, because it's, it's a pedestrian area, you're looking at 18 kilometers, right? So if you think, if, I don't know if you know where O2 is, yeah. Just in the distance, about uh, a mile, two miles away, they're building new housing. So what uh, the, the concept of the last mile, is an that's an example. So they want these vehicles to be used on this pedestrian causeway, for want of a better word, so the people that can then access the underground, the metro station nearby, and then they can just call the vehicles as and when uh, they require. But that's, that's a real example of what's going to be demonstrated over the course of the next two years. What would be the advantage over DLR or putting a tram? Infrastructure costs. Mm. This, that vehicle doesn't require tracks, doesn't require electrical overheads, it's a substantial saving in infrastructure costs. That's, that's, that's what the, the UK government and uh, I mean, we're looking at one uh, for a city where they want to link the bay with the rest of the city. Well, they had thought about putting in trams and you saw what happened in Sheffield with tram building, Bordeaux the same. It takes years. And then of course you're static, whereas these vehicles can be repositioned as and when okay but thank you Hugh pleasure right the last bit do you want to switch me off oh yes please I enjoyed turning you on I'm a robot there you go that's terrible isn't it um right where are we the law, um, yeah, the, the, the law and robotics, um, how will the law deal with this, this new technology? I like to think, going back to that 1995 analogy, that certainly from a common law perspective, we have the ability in England and Wales um, to use the principles and practices that we've developed over the course of X hundred of years to deal with technological change. Um, 1995, the law of contract did not change just because we were selling things over the internet. However, when it came to looking at, oh, I, I received the wrong thing and I paid this bloke in Croatia loads of money, or France, if you use a better example, France loads of money, and what I turned, what's turned up at my doorstep is not what I've ordered, regulation came in and typical EU type of approach, let's protect consumers, let's have distance selling regulations and make sure that consumers are protected when they're using this new technology. I think from England and Welsh point of view, the common law will be able to deal with changes from a robotics perspective. perspective. However, I think there are a lot of things that, that we will need to have regulation for, and some of these will, will come out as I, as I talk. So this is what I'm going to look at, um, the Robo Law Project, a, a particular project funded by the EU, just go through that briefly, and then look at some areas of law which I think will be particularly relevant when it comes to how legislators are going to deal with developments of, of law in this area around liability and risk. I think there are a great number of ethical issues that will need to be taken into account when legislators look at what laws need to be changed and adapted. And also picking up on, on Hugh's point and the five million bond, how legislators deal with the trade-off between innovation and stifling innovation. So regulation for growth or regulation to protect consumers. Before we get there, of course, 
Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a quote that um, Jennifer Urban uh, put forward, and, and this is where we're at. We are on the cusp of, of, of robots um, interacting with us on a day-by-day -day basis. Drones are always in the news. Drones are changing the law. Drones have changed the, the laws of the, Federa um, the FAA in the States, have changed aviation laws. The CAA in the UK is changing aviation laws to take account of the fact that people are flying drones around. Driverless cars are being tested on the roads. Exoskeletons are being produced and they're enabling uh, disabled people to get up and walk. Um, and they're also being used by the inf US in infantry to look at making their infantry soldiers far more efficient, able to carry more weight um, around the battlefield and being quicker and stronger. Surgical systems are being used. Um, the Da Vinci machine uh, was shown by Andrew. It will come up again in another slide. Um, care of the elderly is seen as a fertile ground for the use of robotics. And of course, softbots, what Andrew was talking about, robotic process automation, robotics, um, what, the, what was the definition that you used previously? Uh, software uh, macros on steroids, I think you used. But yes, that, those softbots are in use in the financial services industry as, as, we, as we speak. Um, are we surrounded? Should we look at the Stephen Hawking thing and, 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 and all give up? Uh, are we going to, is Skynet and Terminator a documentary or is it a sci-fi film? Um, will lawyers save humanity through, through regulation? I like to think so. Um, but, and let's look at the first attempt. Um, the Robo Law Project, it was EU funded uh, investigation into ethics and, and the legal processes around robotics and that technology. Specifically, the aim was to offer an in-depth analysis of the ethical and legal issues raised by robotic applications and to provide the European and national regulators with guidelines on how to deal with this new technology. It looked at four main areas, driverless cars was one of them, uh, surgical robots, prosthetics and care robots. Uh, interestingly, it didn't deal with drones or attack systems at all, but it looked at those four, those four issues. Um, it reported uh, in September 2014, and if you go to Google and you put in Robo Law Project, it, you'll be able to get through to the site and, and, and download uh, the actual uh, report itself, which runs to 200 odd pages. Um, the main findings around these things were that the list, uh, existing legal frameworks will need to be adjusted, and that's no, no great surprise. Um, the role that the ethics plays. In, in regulating this technology and in, and in being used by uh, regulators and, and legislators to, to craft laws is going to be something that will come to the, come to the fore. It's something that uh, we'll get into it uh, uh, slightly more detail later, but it's something, the interaction between humans and machines is a philosophical, ethical boundary that legislators haven't necessarily been have, have, had to deal with in the past, but it's something that we will need to deal with with this new technology. Um, human enhancement and, and, and that the effects of that will need to be dealt with and, and liability was one of the big issues that, that came out of the Robo Law Project and how countries will deal with the liability and risk around who's responsible for driverless car crashes. Now, we, you know, Hughes, Hughes alluded to, um, will it be the driver, will it be the manufacturer? In the UK, of course, we've got the Consumer Protection Act. We give strict liability for the manufacture of defective products. But is it that simple? Is it the manufacturer of the car that is going to be responsible if a driverless car has an accident? You know, what is the manufacturer of a driverless car? Is it BMW? Is it the chassis? Is it the software? Is it the network provider? Is it the car itself? And one of, the, one of the interesting things that's come out of the Robo Law Project is looking at whether, in certain situations, there is going to be a new classification of robots themselves having a legal status. Now, if I draw that analogy out in, into, the, into, the, into what happens if a driverless car has a crash, how does the insurance industry typically deal with crashes between cars? In the UK, not for knock. Uh, you've, got, you've got each individual has, has insurance on his or her car. There is a fault-based system. For a driverless car scenario, insurance companies are looking at whether that fault-based system actually works anymore or whether we look at a Swedish-type model where everyone pays into a big pot and if someone has an accident, then the injured party just claims from that big national pot. That may be one way of looking at driverless cars. The driverless car itself 
has some sort of legal status, there is an accident, and whoever is injured just claims from a big national pot. Perhaps one way of dealing with these things. Um, but certainly there has to, be a has to be a debate around liability of something that has inflicted damage and loss on another, another person. Um, is the manufacturer a systems integrator? Is the driver a software program? And when I say systems integrator, if I go back to what is the car, if it's the chassis from BMW, if it's a telemetric system that's produced by Jaguar Land Rover, if it's a network provided by Telefonica, and it's all brought together by a third party and integrated, and these people are providing the actual integration and making those driverless cars run around a system, Again, who is the driver? Who is at fault? From a lawyer's perspective, um, you know, it creates a lot of questions. From a regulator's perspective, it, cre it creates even more questions. How do I regulate this? How do I legislate this? I know that um, if driverless cars are going to be put on the roads of Europe, existing road traffic laws will need to change immediately because the term driver means a human being being behind the wheel. But if that human being doesn't actually control anything, who is the driver? Uh, the same types of approach uh, and the same types of, of issues arise when you're looking at, at care robots. Um, you know, today, 80 million Europeans suffer some sort of mild to severe disability. And as a demographic, we are all getting older and older in Europe. And the qu big question is, how do we care for our elderly people? And this is where robotic systems, the, the, the lift and shift machines... Um, companionship type machines are, are coming into to, to, to line and if you look at um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a product called Giraffe G-I-R-A-F-F -F, which is a telepresence system whereby the, the robot itself has a little iPad screen and I can call up anyone, so my, my relative in a, in a home somewhere and that robot will follow my relative around and I can connect via um, my, my laptop and move that robot around and have a conversation with, with my elderly relative. That's great from, from some perspectives, uh, but what happens if that robot goes bonkers and starts charging around the room, knocking things over, including my elderly relative? You know, big, big, big questions. Um, drones and autonomous attack systems, you know, how is that going to impact upon, upon law? In, last week, in the, U, the UN had held a meeting in Geneva to discuss the ethical and legal challenges posed by the development of such systems, and such systems are beginning to be developed by BAE. There's, there's a big um, there's upswing of opinion that, that the Geneva Convention itself will need to change in order to take account of these autonomous attack systems where human beings aren't actually involved at all. Uh, quite interesting stuff. Uh, and prosthetic limbs and brain computer interfaces. Um, by, br we have the ability now, and if you go onto the web, you can see many examples of effectively decoding brain waves. Um, those brain waves are then re encoded into prosthetic limbs that people have implanted into them, and those brain waves can make those limbs move. Uh, that's, that's where we're heading, which is fantastic from a enabling the disabled perspective. But from a liability perspective, we are into the realms of ethical, philosophical, and general product liability issues. If I have a series of prosthetic limbs that are connected to my brain and the software goes wrong and I kill someone, am I actually going to be liable for murder? Or is it a product liability issue? Discuss. And these are the types of the things that the Robo Law Project has been, has been dealing with and talking about and providing recommendations upon. Now, the ethical issues, um, and I mentioned earlier, very, a, an important aspect of what came out of the Robo, Robo Law Project was how, what is it to be a human being? What, what will robotics do and how do they enhance, how do they interact with humans and how does the law have to deal with these, these issues? If I draw the example of, from, from a care robot perspective, um, is there a right to be taken care of? Does one have a right in the UK to be looked after? And I think if you look at the way we deal with the NHS, we have a great uh, health system, and the general view is we will have a right to be looked after by the NHS. Now, does that mean that as, these, as this technology develops, we should all have access to care robots? Well, there's obviously a cost implication of that, 
at the moment because some of these things cost tens of thousands of pounds. But as they become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, is it then an effective right of every individual in this country to have your own care robot in your own home paid for by the NHS? Is there an issue of a, a loss of human association and, and, and a loss of freedom, a loss of dignity? Um, you know, these things have been discussed by the Robo Law Project as well. Are you going to replace caregivers with machines um, and, and therefore do the society as a whole, does it, does it create a, a feeling that we've relieved ourselves of a responsibility look at, to look after our elderly kin? Um, real issues because we're all getting older. Real issues because we don't have the money to provide care through the use of human carers. So what do we do next? The technology is there. We could use the technology to look after our elderly folk, but is it fair? Does it, does it contravene all the European conventions around human rights to have freedom of association, to have dignity, to have privacy? You know, the privacy issues around having care robots, which again, the, the general recommendations is that the care robots would have data boxes within them, black boxes, to record the information about what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis in case something goes wrong. And those machines exist. Those machines yeah. exist at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. The lift, the lift and shift. And someone has written, written a quote, and I'll read it out. You know, do you want to be treated like an object, pushed, lifted, pumped, or drained by a machine? You know, that, those. It's it's that lack of dignity that that, that, that you've got that you've got a, a real trade-off between the use of the technology, which is there, which is going to develop over the next 20 years, and people will make use of, and then you've got the European. Convention on Human Rights and Human Rights Legislation, do we allow our, our elderly people to never have contact with human beings again? But it's also the sensitivity issue, isn't it? Because Massively. Yeah. Pay, you know, yeah. 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 And regulate around. So it's all very, and this is the, the application that what I'm really talking about is in years to come, um, are the produ producers of care robots, are they going to have to be regulated in the way that they use their machines? Yes, from a safety perspective, absolutely, because it's a consumer product, a safety perspective. The use of those machines, are, are there going to be specific regulations on how many, how many machines are there per care home? You have to have human beings in those care homes. It's that type of approach that I think you know, legislators will need to deal with because this new technology, which we've all understood is here and will develop, it will have a massive impact upon our lives. Um, prosthetics is, 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 is another great ethical issue. Um, what is it to be human? It's a fantastic thing when if someone's hurt in a, in a riding accident. It's a fantastic thing to watch them on YouTube being put in exoskeleton and being able to lift themselves up and move around and walk. Marry that up with the US infantryman who's now being a, a, a superhuman and charging around the battlefield like Robocop, like Terminator, and you have a technology issue. You know, you have technology and you have an ethical and philosophical issue. If I replace a limb because I've lost one, fantastic. Is it cosmetic surgery? like cosmetic surgery in later years if I think well actually it would be great if I could if I could hold if I could have two hands that held really hot things it would make me much better at my job working in a smelting factory I'll tell you what I'll have my arms cut off and replaced it would be a much better thing for my kids if they could run really quickly so I'm going to replace their legs ultimately as humans have always progressed humans have always wanted to enhance their abilities the big ethical issue is will we, will we allow prosthetics to be, to be used to enable the enabled? Will we allow that technology to just be um, given to everybody throughout the free world to use and, and make money out of? Or do we have to regulate the use of that technology very much like with the way we regulate the use of genomic research and atomic weapons research? We, we wouldn't want some of this technology to get into the hands of the bad guys. You know, crazed people charging about 20 people with an exoskeleton in 25 years' time. 
that's, that's going to be a, 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 a little army that could create havoc. This technology is here, you know, it's being used, it will only improve over time. And, you know, I say glibly that, that, that lawyers will save humanity, but it's this area particularly where I think regulation will, will come in um, and the use of the technology will be restricted. Um, but I say again, enabling the enabled and the use of this technology for good things is, is, is a fantastic opportunity for humankind. You're going to bring a whole range of people back to the workforce. You're going to create a whole different vibe around what, what is disability. You, know, it, it, you could effectively um, reduce it to zero. People aren't disabled anymore. Great things, but with all these things come challenges. Um, and briefly around innovation and regulation, and I think the US and the Europeans do have a different approach to these things. Um, chatting to guys from MIT that I met a few years ago, they are very much, and, and, and specifically people who develop prosthetic legs, they are very much, I've spent millions developing these legs, I should be able to I sell this technology to anyone who wants to buy it. Europeans have a different approach. Um, it's a, very much a consumer-led, consumer protection type approach. We want to make sure that every consumer in Europe is, has, a fair, has, a, has, a, has a product that works and will not harm them. So it's the lack of harm um, versus the, I want to be able to make as much money as I possibly can. And, and, and therein lies a challenge. Uh, the, the, the protection of consumers versus innovation for all. Um, Driverless, driverless cars, you've got a debate between, uh, at the moment, my car, the car that I drive around in, has got all sorts of autonomous features. It turns the lights on, it turns the windscreen wipers on, it tells me when I'm too close to a lorry, which frankly I can see anyway, but it does make a bleep. Um, but, but what is the impact, what will be the impact uh, on the driverless car industry when there is the first accident? And, and Hugh mentioned 94% of, uh, of accidents have human error. But can you imagine the tabloid out, outcry when the first driverless car has an accident and someone's killed? Now that might be one journey in billions, but it might impact the actual development of, of, of that industry. So how is the insurance industry going to do with this? How is society going to do with this? Um, do we want to have regulations that, that place driverless cars at, at a higher level of, uh, um, uh, of liability than the normal drivers? Who knows? Or a lesser liability? Who knows? Uh, but all these things will need to be talked about and all these things will need to be uh, legislated for. Um, surgical robots, well, at the moment, the, the, the Da Vinci robot is, is, is classified in a particular medical bracket um, alongside uh, other invasive devices that don't necessarily touch the heart or the teeth. But you could, you could argue it's, it's treated in the same way as a scalpel. Now, the Da Vinci surgical robot is a very sophisticated piece of kit. It, it goes into your body and provides minimally invasive surgery on, on various things. It's clearly, it's not the same as a scalpel. Clearly, there is an issue around who is going to be, who is going to be liable if that machine causes someone's death or, or, or injury. Um, the, the, the questions that are out there really are how, how regulators will differentiate that type of machine from a scalpel. What, who's going to be liable if that machine causes harm? Is it the hospital? Is it the surgeon? Is it the software program? Is it the maintenance people who haven't maintained this thing properly? Um, and interesting enough, one of, the, one of the specific recommendations out of the RoboLaw project was that the Da Vinci machine should be treated a bit like an, a, an airline simulator. S surgeons should have a certain amount of surgeon time on this. And uh, at the moment, there's, no, there's nothing to say that a surgeon who's never used this thing can't get on and use it and, and perform an operation. But clearly, that would be a dangerous thing to do, I would suggest, if someone's never used a sophisticated piece of equipment. But at the moment, it's a, ro it's a robot, but it's treated very much like a blunt instrument. You know, these things are different things. Um, so the differentiation between the te old technology, new technology, that is something that our legal system will need to grapple with in the future. Again, I go back to 1995, where we were, how we dealt with um, interaction between ourselves from a, from a social perspective, how we dealt with, with crime. Crime over the internet didn't exist, and then all of a sudden we've got a whole raft of laws that deal with crime and how we and terrorist crime over the internet and, and pornography over the internet and abuse of people over the internet. 
You know, this, these sorts of things are going to have to be looked at from a very, very detailed perspective. The British government has put robotics right at the top of its agenda for the next 20 years. Um, and I had the privilege of going down to the Bristol Robotics Laboratory a month or so ago, and it was absolutely fascinating the work that, that they were doing down there. And just chatting with them about how they see the law. You know, there's a lot of people there d involved in the development of, of robots, and they simply have not got a clue about how, this, how, the, how they're going to deal with issues around liability and risk. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an area that is very new, it's an area that's growing, and it's an area that law, instead of playing catch-up, should, we should take account of the developments coming and put procedures in place now, I would suggest. So I think that is us done. And uh, if we have any more questions, then please feel free to ask us. And I'll disappear behind here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm conscious that we've overrun by a couple of minutes, but uh, any more questions from anybody for the panel? Yes.